Okay, so everybody's got their warning. Going to mute everybody, except for Yancy. Okay, take it away, Yancy. Okay, let me share my screen here and get into uh, presentation mode. So uh, here we go, right here. Um, I want to start out with a disclaimer. I am my financial advisor at Merrill Lynch and Ben. I do financial planning and uh, investment management, all that kind of stuff. I am not a guide. I am not a fly shop owner, uh, but I have spent considerable time uh, in the Klamath Basin. Uh, you know, for over ten years now, it's been my home away from home in the summer. Uh, I. Uh, for years, led uh, Central Oregon fly fisher outings down there. I've, I've been a member of COF for 17 years and most of that on the board. Um, so I've got a ton of experience down there, but if you know something down there that I don't know, or if you say something that you, or if I say something you disagree with, or if there is anything at all you wanna ask about or you can contribute, don't hesitate. Uh, I can always learn more and, and the group will benefit. Uh, it's not a huge crowd here. So, uh, you know, let's, let's make this as interactive as possible. So, uh, and that's my email address down there. Feel free to reach out. Um, happy to uh, answer questions or chat with you. You know, we can set up a phone call, whatever you want to do. Um, I love the Klamath Basin. Um, it's in trouble, uh, you know, environmentally, and we'll talk about that some, but it is a, just a wonderful place to fish. So uh, on that note, um, that's a picture of me um, holding a fish that uh, is not small. <laughs> uh, I'm not a small person and you can see my fingers there are maybe a third of the way up the size of this thing. It's right around 30 inches. It's the legendary 10 pound rainbow trout. And that's what I love about this area. It is, um, you know, big fish, which I'm a big fish bigot. Uh, it is, uh, they're wild fish. Uh, they're native fish, and these are not synonyms. This is, uh, I hear this all the time, people saying, oh, they're, they're native fish when they should be saying they're wild fish. You know, a, a bass can be wild, but it's not native. Um, you know, a native fish is something that, uh, you know, evolved in that water way, was not, you know, introduced by human beings. And uh, these fish are, are big, which I love. Um, they're wild. They're native and it's a challenging river. And I've been fishing now for, oh gosh, approaching 50, well, over 50 years now. And um, I love a challenge and th these are challenging fish. Uh, as you're gonna see in this presentation, uh, the way I fish this river is by stripping back streamers. And I personally love that style of fishing. I love, you know, the, the casting a line out, letting it sink, having my hand on the line, stripping it back and having that connection with the line and the fish, especially a big fish, when they take that fly, you know, the tug is the drug. Uh, um, I'm also a steelhead junkie or was when they were steelhead, but uh, you can still do that down there. Um, sure, there are other people and there are places where it might be a little crowded, but the Klamath Basin is huge. It's very low population and uh, I'm kind of averse to crowds and you can get down there and you can have a wonderful experience um, and, you know, see just a few people. And, uh, you know, we'll talk, we'll focus on the, um, the Williamson River today, but there are lots and lots of places to explore down there. I, I get down there as often as I can in the summer. I have a uh, pickup truck with a lance camper on the back and I hook up my drift boat behind there and I'll go down there for four or five days and just cruise to all different kinds of places and just you know camp next to rivers it's just it's just an amazing place so let's start off by talking about the river um, and there's really uh, 
two kind of big chunks of it. I, I, I'm assuming that everyone kind of knows where it is. You know, from, from Bend, it's about two hours down 97 to uh, this spot right here, Chiloquin. Um, there are actually spots along the river that you're driving, but you can't really see it till you get right about here. And there's kind of the upper river up here, and then there's the lower river. Uh, Klamath Marsh is this big marshy, it's really kind of a, now it's mainly been drained and, and it's, it's cow pasture, but there's Klamath Marsh in there. And there's, there's still some water in there and there's a lot of, a lot of migratory birds. Um, uh, there's a place up here called Yamsey Ranch, which is a pay to fish spot. Um, it's really the only good, easy access on the entire upper river. Uh, there's a paved road right out to it. Um, it's you know it's on a little bit on the expensive side, but uh, and it's off grid. You know it's it's totally uh, it's it's uh, it's been like that for you know 100 years. It's just so far out there. Um, and this part of the river here, uh, I fish it every year. Um, it's that that's uh, something that you'd have to buy me a beer to tell you how to do that, other than staying at the Yamsey. But the Yamsey ranches ranches up there. It's a small spring creek, uh, lots of dry fly action. Um, very difficult access, mostly private property, and you either have to have made friends with a rancher or know where it's okay to get in on public land. And then the river uh, keeps going down here, and then it basically disappears right about here into this thing called Klamath Marsh. It goes underground, um, and then it emerges right around in here again as this um, small, kind of ugly river to be honest is this tea color brown river um you know because it's getting all the sediments and nutrients and everything from the marsh um you would never want to fish this and then there's these falls right here which are impassable so the fish above here are distinct from the fish down here these are different fish um, they're, you know, they can be, they're reasonable sized fish, you know, maybe 18 inches, a lot of 16 inch fish. Occasionally you get something big, but it's not until you get down here um, until uh, you get into, you know, the, the big fish. And uh, if you want the presentation, I'll be happy to send it to you. So I see someone there with a the camera right now, send me an email, send me the presentation. I'm not, there's nothing proprietary about this. I don't make a living doing this. Um, and really the fishing doesn't start until right here. There's this thing called uh, Spring Creek. I'm sure you've driven over a million times. It's right there at the Collier Memorial State Park. Um, uh, that's where the majority of water in this upper part comes from. Uh, this, this graphic is, is, is incorrect in its representation. It looks like it's a big river here. It's not, it's actually a little tiny little creek. And most of the water comes in right here. And that's where uh, the fish kind of go up to. They'll go up to right there and they'll go up here to spawn. Unfortunately, and you can fish this section. Unfortunately, it's very difficult access. Uh, and you can only fish uh, from the shore and the shore is all private. So I fished it a few times. I read, there's a VRBO here. I rented the VRBO and you know, I got in my, uh, in, in my kayak actually. Uh, would kayak to various spots, get out, find spots where I could stand, you know, up to my waist and fish. And, and, and there's a ton of fish in there. But I'm, I'm leading up to the good stuff. Where you are probably going to fish and where all the guides will take you and where anyone who's talking about the Williamson is fishing is basically from Chiloquin down about an eight mile stretch to Highway 97, where there's this thing called the Water Road RV Campground. And that, those were the two um, access points. We'll talk about that more in a second. But this right here is the stretch that everyone fishes. I love this stretch. It's a great stretch. Uh, I also fish all the way down to the lake. We're not going to talk about that today. Uh, that's an unusual place. I rarely see other people down there. Um, after you've mastered this section of the river, if you want to give me a call or send me an email, I'll tell you how to fish this section. So, uh, 
So just quick, real quick, uh, that's yours truly here. Um, decent fish. Uh, I love this photograph just because of the sky and it's so pretty. And um, that's, that fish there, that's a couple years ago. Uh, this is uh, my friend Carl. Uh, that's a fish from last summer. Um, so, you know, more, more pictures of big fish. You're going to see lots of pictures of big fish. Uh, common uh, mis, uh, misperception or common misunderstanding is that uh, these are landlocked steelhead. They're not. Uh, as I mentioned before the talk, I'm, I'm on the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, Restoration and Enhancement Board, and we paid for a genetic study of these fish, and uh, they're a unique strain of desert red band trout. Uh, they're not landlocked steelhead, but I will tell you, as someone who's caught a lot of uh, Deschutes steelhead, these are often bigger. Um, like steelhead, they're adfluvial, meaning you know they they try to spend as much time living in lakes as they can, um, but then spawn up in the tributaries. And in this case, uh, oh, I should say, the reason they want to spend as much time in the lake as they can is because Klamath Lake is an amazing food source. I'm sure you've driven along 97, along Klamath Lake, and uh, you know, had to stop and clean off your windshield, right? There's just all these midges, you're driving through clouds of, of macroinvertebrates, you know, everything's getting messed up. Well, that's an amazing food source and it's why these fish get so big. They're just swimming around with their mouths open, just sucking these things in. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fish do come out of the lake. Uh, they come out of the lake because they wanna spawn. And these fish, just like fish in the Deschutes, spawn year round. It's not, you know, there was a lot of thought that, oh, they spawn at this time of year or that time of year. They go in and out to spawn. And they also get out to cool off. Um, as you probably know, Klamath Lake is this huge lake in terms of surface area, but it's mostly very shallow. There are a few deeper channels, but Klamath Lake is, uh, you know, six feet deep, four feet deep, three feet deep in places. And it's hot down there. You know, you're fishing in the summer, it's 80 degrees, 90 degrees, and that water warms up and the fish have got to get out. So they're going up into these tributaries, um, you know, which are spring, but which are uh, spring fed, uh, spring, spring origin. Um, you know, the Wood River will be 55 degrees in August. Uh, the Williamson gets a little warmer, but it too will be, you know, beautiful temperature for fish. Uh, all through the summer. So you find these fish, you know, fleeing, fleeing the, uh, the, the lake uh, when temperature requires it. And, and uh, they're just, they can be gorgeous. Um, here's my friend, Matt. He's got another, I don't think it's quite a 10 pound fish, but another very nice fish. Again, Matt is not a small man and his fingers, you know, barely getting up halfway on this thing. Uh, you can see a lot of photos of my son, Ish, Ethan, another very nice fish. He's obviously got a big smile on his face. Um, so you fish this area, um, the Williams in the wood uh, from May 22nd to October 31st. It's not a very long season. Um, and it uh, used to be, I would say, hey, wait to go till July because, uh, you know, you got to wait till the lake heats up and, and, and the fish will come out. Um, fish are always in the river going in back and forth. But, you know, when the lake heats up, uh, there's more big ones moving in. Uh, I will tell you, and we're going to talk about this some more here, uh, the, the drought down there is far worse than here, it's made a dramatic impact on the fishing. And I'll talk about this some more, but um, this year I plan on fishing her far earlier than I would have ever done in the past. Um, you know, I think by mid August, it can, they might even have the river closed um, because uh, the rivers are gonna be so low and they're gonna be so warm that you might not even be able to fish come mid, mid August. I'm not, I haven't heard that for certain, but given the fact that we've been closing, ODFW has been closing other rivers uh, in these kind of conditions, I would not be at all surprised. So I would move it up my trips down there um, to, you know, 
June, which I never used to do, and, and July. Uh, there's also a hexagena mayfly hatch. Uh, if you've never fished the hex hatch, it's worth doing. That's a whole different presentation, but I'm sure you can go online and learn everything you need to know about hex hatches. Um, it's frankly, it's technically illegal to hex hatch because you are fishing in the dark. And of course that is illegal in Oregon, but everyone seems to do it. And I've certainly done it. Um, and it's an amazing experience to be out there in the dark, you know, hearing these monster fish rise up aggressively, take these huge flies, splash down, you cast out, you can't see where that, what the heck is going on. You're just casting out there and waiting until you feel this monster tug and, and, and mm -hmm. game on. Um, it's worth trying once at least. So I'm gonna show you lots of trophy photos, lots of photos you go, oh my God, look at that fish. And I can't tell you how many people I've taken fishing, fishing where they said, you know, biggest trout they ever caught. Very, very common. They're not all huge, you know, there are, 14 inch fish in there and there's 16 inch fish in there. Uh, this is my friend, Scott. And this is me a long time ago, you know, over 10 years ago, back when I would take a picture of anything that had any size because I was so excited to catch a big fish. And the reason I'm showing you both of these photos is because if you see, there are all these lesions, all these sores, all these ugly things on the fish. And if you can see right here, there's like these little white dots. Those are cocoa pods, which are a parasite, a small crustacean. crustacean. And uh, Klamath Lake is filled with them. And uh, when the water gets warm, they just multiply like crazy. Unfortunately, they're, they're not a food source. <laughs> the, the trout are a food source for cocoa pods. And um, one of the things you'll see uh, and you'll catch are fish. They're just flat out ugly like this. Um, and what this means is the fish has recently come in from the lake. Um, and uh, after a very short period of time in the cooler water, the cocoa pods will, will drop off and the fish will heal up. There's, it's rare for cocoa pods to do any kind of lasting damage to these fish. Um, it, it, they've adapted to be in this environment with these lesions. That's not true everywhere. There are places where cocoa pods do kill juvenile trout by um, uh, uh, getting into their gills and, and into their eyes. It, that doesn't happen with these fish. They don't, the cocoa pods don't kill them, but when you catch an ugly fish, just be prepared. Um, it will happen. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's a small percentage of the fish, but there they are. So I just wanted to warn you about that. Uh, and believe me, I don't take pictures of fish with cocoa pods on it anymore. That's an old photo. Um, so again, another, lot more really great pictures, right? Uh, a couple more shots of my son. That's a very nice fish there. Um, it can be worth it. I love fishing this river. I, I fish this river all the time. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful place to fish for all the reasons I mentioned, um, but it's tough. And if you've never fished there before and you're used to kind of normal trout fishing on a river or a lake, it's really different. Um, and, you know, first of all, are there fish in the river that day? Are, they, are there fish in that spot, right? Has the lake gotten to a, a temperature where it's driving them in? Are they holding where you happen to be that day? Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. As you're going to hear from me in a second, I keep moving until I find the fish. Uh, it's very difficult to, to read this water. We'll talk about this some more. Uh, it doesn't look like any other river where you would think of as being a trout river. Um, it's, it's, it's more like a, a slow moving lake in most places. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of submerged rocks and ledges that you're not gonna see until it's too late and it's gonna take your fly. Um, so, uh, the casting, um, you know, you need to have a good cast. Um, you don't have to fish the way I fish. There are other people who fish other ways, but the way I found to be most productive um, requires you to make a reasonable cast, you know, consistent 40 to 60 foot cast. You know, if you can do 40, that's good enough. If you can do 60, even better. 
Um, and you need, you need to be able to do that with a sinking line, you know, intermediate type three or type six. We'll touch on that in a second. And you can't be slapping the water. If you're water loading or you're slapping the water while you're casting, you're going to scare the fish. So there is some skill required um, with catching these fish, which is, again, part of the attraction for me. And I will tell you, it took me a few years to get this thing really figured out. But once you get it figured out, I mean, I'll catch 15 fish over 24 inches in a day. And to me, <laughs> that's heaven. Um, you do need a boat. Uh, that section from uh, Col from Chiloquin down to 97 uh, is all private property. There's no public access there other than the ramps. Um, so, you know, you can get out of the boat along the, in certain spots, but you can't get up on the, on the shore. Um, I use a drift boat. I have a drift boat with a, you know, gas outboard motor and electric tro trolling motor. I, I don't use the gas outboard motor in this section that I'm talking about today, but I use the trolling motor. Um, the problem with the drift boat, I mean, I love my drift boat. I use it all the time. It's my favorite uh, uh, vessel to fish from. Um, there are places I have to get out and drag it over the rocks. So there's to it. And uh, there are places where I've just really smashed my boat bad. I just got my boat back from Koffler Boats. As a matter of fact, it, where they hammered out all the dings and the chines from fishing this river. Um, I cannot overemphasize the use of a stripping bucket. Um, when I started using this, you know, some number of years ago, it changed my life. Uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but uh, normally when I'm in a boat or my pontoon boat and I'm trying to make a long cast, my, you know, half the time my line gets caught on something and the whole cast gets destroyed and any fish I was trying to, uh, to go after is getting scared and, and moving on. So, uh, you know, this is a 15 gallon uh, water bucket. You can buy these things at uh, Sportsman's Warehouse, take cut off the top, pull about two inches of water on the bottom strip a bunch of line out in that thing, you know, do your double haul, you know, make, execute a great cast and never get your line caught on your feet, anything in the boat. It, it's, it'll change your life if you're a lake fisherman or a river fisherman or anyone fishing out of a, a drift boat. This is, I can't tell you, this is as important, for me, it's as important as knowing how to make a good cast. Uh, I also like fishing from a pontoon boat. You know, if I'm fishing by myself uh, on a trip, I'll take my pontoon boat. Um, you know, you're still going to have to get out and drag it over some spots. Um, you know, you don't have electric motor, so you're going to have to put rows some. Uh, I personally love to have my fins on. So as I'm going down some new slow sections, I can have my hands free on my rod. I have a stripping, you know, basket out in front of me there. And then I can use my fence to position myself uh, in the spots I want on the river. So in some ways, pontoon boats, I think are preferable. There are no bad sections of this river. There are no rapids to be worried about. You know, what you have to be worried about are these shallow places that you have to get out and drag things. Um, so is that the right spot? Yeah. So where to launch? Uh, well, you launch, uh, right here at the boat launch, uh, and I'll show you this a little bit better, um, near Chiloquin. So this is the this is the Williamson River here. This is Prague River coming in, uh, and there's a, a boat launch uh, right there. Uh, until just two years ago, this was just a horrible boat launch. It's just this nasty dirt thing, and it was very, very difficult place to launch a boat. Uh, even a pontoon boat. Uh, a couple years ago, this was uh, paved and new, you know, pit toilets were put in there. And now it's a very nice boat ramp. Um, and then you float, it's a free boat ramp. Um, ODFW actually owns it. And then you float down here to the water wheel, just under 97. And I'll, I'll talk about this in some more detail here. Um, this is a $10 fee to use the ramp unless you're camped there, which is what I normally am. I'm normally camped there. Uh, and then it's free. And uh, just some, some markers there. Uh, here's the Clamoya Casino. There's a, I'll talk about this in more in a second, but there's a, a motel there and, and, you know, a truck stop with uh, 
a pizza joint in it. And then uh, right here is uh, a lonesome duck, um, which is uh, another place you could stay if you wanted to. It's uh, it's kind of nice. I stayed there a couple of times. It's uh, you know kind of like uh, some cabins, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. So that's where you launch. That's where you take out. I want to do a shout out to Denny Rickards. Uh, Denny, uh, author of you know many books, semi-retired guide, former owner of Rocky Point Resort on Klamath Lake. I'll show you that here in just a second. Uh, he lives in Fort Klamath on, on the Wood River uh, and is the inventor of the intermediate sink line. So I'm assuming you guys, uh, you know, fish lakes around here and you probably use sinking lines. Well, the intermediate sink line is something that Denny invented many years ago is the Cortland Camel line. And he invented many fly patterns, uh, including the seal bug. What was the right answer? Big bird. Oh, there you go. Okay, was that a question or? Five and a half years old. I guess not. So uh, anyways, invented a lot of fly patterns. All the stuff was designed for fishing Klamath Lake and its tributaries, um, which is, you know, he owned this thing called Rocky Point Resort, which is on, uh, on Klamath Lake. Uh, Let's picture him many years ago. This is not a Klamath Basin Red Band. Now all Denny does is he uh, guides, uh, you know, private lakes that are stocked with, with fish. So, and that's a picture of one of those things that he does. Uh, I buy all my Klamath Basin flies from him. Um, I'm not a tire, I'm a buyer. I don't have time, I'm still working. I don't have time to, to, uh, to tie. And uh, frankly, the tie, the flies I buy from him are very, very good. Uh, here's his website. Um, I have literally six boxes, double-sided, you know, the little flip thing in the middle, uh, filled with various sizes and colors of his seal buggers and his still water bugs. Um, and if you want to, I do this every year. I call him up, just chat with him. Guy loves to talk. Some people find that irritating. I just have my pencil and paper out and I'm taking notes the whole time. So uh, if, our, if I was gonna recommend something to you, it'd be to uh, call him up before you go down there, ask him you know, what to buy and just buy it. So uh, what, what equipment do you use? I can't emphasize enough that you have to use a six weight rod. These are big fish. They're not as powerful as a steelhead, but you know, try to land a eight, if you're lucky, 10 pound fish on a five weight, um, it's, it's, it's not gonna work. Um, the most common line down there is an intermediate sinking line. It's, it's you know, that line was designed for these fish. Uh, it's, if you go with a guide, this is what they'll tell you to bring. Uh, I use the sinking line, uh, intermediate sinking line. Um, I also have uh, these Rio Fathom, lines, uh, type three and type six, not the clean, clean uh, sweep lines. And the reason why is the uh, clean sweep lines are uh, basically, uh, you know, 30 feet of sink and then um, a floating running line behind that. Well, I'm casting 60 plus feet out and I want the whole thing to get down. And I wanna have a level retrieve. I don't wanna have a angled retrieve. So um, I use the real Fathom uh, type three and six. And frankly, I've looked all over for other manufacturers of these kinds of lines and I can't find them. Everyone does this thing where they have a 30 foot head and then a running line behind that, which is not what I want for lakes or for this situation. Um, don't have to be fancy with the, uh, the leader or the tippet. If you want to buy a, you know, a nine foot, fluorocarbon tapered leader for 15 bucks, have at it. Um, or you could buy, you know, a spool of 3X and a spool of uh, 4X straight floral and do just as well. Um, what I typically do is, you know, three to four feet of 3X to a swivel, got to use a swivel, and then another three foot um, of 4X to the fly. Uh, and the reason you have to use a swivel is because if you don't, you're, 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 
leader material, tippet material is going to get all spun up. And you're throwing these, these streamers. Uh, when you throw them in the air, they twist. When you retrieve them, they twist. It's just a mess. And so, you know, for the longest time, I would just do straight, say, six foot of 3X. A lot of people do that. A lot of people just have straight six foot of 3X. But then after every two or three casts, I was having to lift that whole thing up out of the, out of the water for a long time and let it kind of unspin. If you threw a little micro swivel in there and those little teeny tiny swivels, you can barely get the line through. Um, you know, that never happens. You can just keep casting. Uh, if you're not a strong caster, um, you know, take an indicator line and we'll do some nymphing. I'll tell you, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I've only used a traditional floating line a handful of times or a couple of times when there's kind of a, a mayfly hatch happening and I thought I was going to try to make that work and, and it didn't work. I've used it for hex hatches, but it's it's something I know I'll take a, a reel and a spool um, of a floating line in the boat with me just in case, but I, I rarely break it out. And frankly, uh, since I have the room, I have a drift boat, I take three rods with me. Um, you know, an intermediate line, a type three and a type six. And uh, I've, I have three rods. <laughs> I have the space. Why not? Because I, I use them all. If I was uh, only going to take one rod, it would be a type three, you know, full sync, uniform sync line. That's what I would take if I could only take one rod. Guides will say, no, that's wrong. Yes, you're an idiot. You want an intermediate. And I'll show you here in a minute um, where the intermediate is better. And also show you where, uh, you know, having a type three or type six just wins. It's all there is to it. So what's the technique here? Um, these big red bands are what are known as piscivorous fish, meaning <laughs> they'll eat anything. They'll eat other fish, they'll eat, you know, anything they can get their hands on. There was a whole series of steelhead flies uh, developed in the 1950s, but they were not designed for steelhead flies, they were designed for these fish. Uh, and they were later adapted for steelhead on the North Fork of the Umpqua and places like that. But just big streamer style flies. Um, and, uh, you know, Streamers are, are, are what these guys want to eat. Uh, they want to have a lot of protein. Um, they want to, you know, maximize their meal when they're in the, the river. And also, they don't have the same access to macroinvertebrates, right? In, in the lake, there are all these, these uh, midges and other things, you know, coming off. And they, these fish can just kind of swim around with their mouths open. Uh, here in the rivers, there's that same uh, amount of macrovertebrates, and so they're looking for small fish and things like that to eat. Um, now, if you don't like that style of fishing, which I happen to love, um, you know, you can do traditional nymphing, and I've seen plenty of people who do that. A lot of guides will, um, you know, do that because it's, it's it's an easier style of fishing, and if you if you don't have the ability to make those long casts with a sinking line and a, and a, and a streamer of some sort, then, uh, you know, nymphing will work and there are places where you can nymph. And so, you know, go do it, have at it. I've seen lots of people catch a lot of nice fish uh, using nymphs. It's just that the, the opportunity set is much smaller. The number of places where you can do that on this river is far smaller than if you're gonna throw out a sinking line with a streamer. I've also seen uh, guides, I've never done this myself, but I've seen guides do this and I've talked to people who had, uh, you know, got their guides to do this. Um, you know, take a, take a sinking line. I think you mean um, seal buggers. Mm -hmm. What? Seal buggers. Seal buggers. Is there, is there a question? Mm -hmm. Was there, no, I guess not. Um, uh, you can take a sinking line and, you know, put a long uh, uh, leader uh, tippet on there and just let it sink and have a midge on the bottom. And, uh, you know, these fish, they, they eat a lot of midges in the lake. And I've seen a lot of guys that just sit there 
you know, anchor it up in the middle of the river, throw the sinking line out with a midge on, just wait for fish to come by. I think that's like watching paint dry. Um, it teaches on. Uh, my thing, something that works very well for me is, you know, cast a sinking line, strip back a Rickards pattern, and wait for a fish to slam it, because they will, uh, and, and, and hold on. Uh, and what Rickards pattern? I don't know. Like I say, I have six boxes filled with these things. I'll, I'll make uh, four, five, six casts in a place where I'm really confident there's a fish, and if it doesn't work, I'll change it. Sometimes the black version works. Sometimes the black with the grizzly hackle works. Sometimes the green one works. Sometimes the rust one works. Sometimes the orange one works. Sometimes the white one works. I don't know why. I just cast it out there. If it works, great. I stick with it till it doesn't work and then I change it. Would you show one? Yeah, I'm gonna show you flies here in a second. Good question. Uh, I believe that the key is to cover the water. Just like with steelhead fishing. Uh, you're not, you will see fish leaping out of the water and splashing down. Those are not fish that are eating. Those are fish that are trying to knock off the cocoa pods. But at least you know they're there. You're not going to see fish sipping flies off the surface because that's not what they do. So the key thing here, in my opinion, is go to places that have a high probability of holding a fish. Make a few casts. If it doesn't work, change the fly. If it doesn't work, keep moving. You've got a lot of water to cover. Um, so we'll talk about this some more in a second here, but uh, you know, there are these deeper channels or there are shallow places that are you know four feet deep. And then these deeper channels, which are 20 feet deep. Um, and those channels can hold a lot of fish because they're just hanging out down there at the bottom. They're not really trying to do anything. And that's where you, you, you pull out your type six, maybe a type three, if it's only a 10 foot channel. Um, and then when the water's slow, um, you're going to cast to the bank of the frog water. And I'll show you this in a second, but you know, you're going down the middle of the river, you're casting you know, directly into the shore. Uh, if it's type three, you're stripping it back really fast. If it's intermediate, you're gonna let it sink just a little bit. And you know, fish will come and get it. And, and that's what the guides will have you do. If, 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 you, if you hire a guide and they can see you can cast and that you have an intermediate line, this is what they'll have you do. They will have you get your intermediate line out. They'll put a, 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 some sort of a streamer pattern on it and they'll go down the middle and you will cast to the bank all day long and you will catch fish. Most of the fish are in this frog water. They're not in the traditional faster moving, ripply, riffly kind of water. It's really counterintuitive. They're in the frog water. It reminds them of home in the lake. Um, and keep slowly moving, which is why I say if you're in a if you're in a pontoon boat, bring your fins. Because when you're in these slow moving areas, um, you're gonna want to just kind of you know move down river, kicking slowly, casting into the bank, and 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 moving. So there are the flies. And I'm sorry, it's not the best picture, but it's the best I could do. Um, I've got my ruler down here. So you can see that these are not small flies. Uh, these, these are seal bugger patterns down here. They're type six or they're size six or size eight. And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're like a woolly bugger kind of thing. But they're, uh, they, have a, they have a different motion in the water, the, the way in which the hackle moves um, and, the, and the weight that there's some lead wrap around the, the shank of the hook there uh, that just makes them move in a way that these fish can't resist. And you know, there are lots of, of on YouTube videos on how to tie these things if you're a tire. Um, Again, it, someday I'll have the time to tie. This, this thing up here, this is a, a, a still water bug. This is, a, this is a, uh, a seal bug or this is a still water bug. And I've got lots of those. And then this thing here, I forget what he calls this. This is just some crazy ass thing he's put, come up with. It's more of a, kind of almost like a sculpin type pattern. Um, so this is, you know, this is what I fish. These guys right here. Um, these guys are uh, hexagena mayflies. 
And you know, this is a what a two and a half inch long fly. <laughs> so hex genes are are pretty amazing, and they're they're yellow, and they're just yellow. Um, and if you ever want to go over and fish the Wood River, which is right next door, then you want to take these big grasshopper patterns, and uh, they can be a lot of fun, especially on a windy day. Oh man, something else to have these a big fish come up and, and grab one of these guys on the surface. So uh, I know it's not the best photo. I apologize for that. Go to Denny's website um, and, and look at his flies and uh, either buy them or figure out how to, how to tie them yourself. But you can see there's nothing dainty about any of this stuff. Okay, so let's, let's uh, take a quick pause here. How am I doing on time? Am I talking too long? I am. Uh, sorry. Whoops. That's not what I want to do. I want to do this. And I want to go over here. Nope. Where is it? What happened to... I want to go here. Okay. We're going to fly the Williamson River. So, Crater Lake, uh, right here, this is Upper Klamath Lake. There's Chiloquin, whoops. There's Chiloquin right here, sorry. Um, if I zoom in, which I can do with my wonderful touchscreen computer. Here's Rocky Point. This is the place where uh, Denny Rickert uh, owned the lodge and uh, developed all his flies. There's a campground there and there's a restaurant. Nancy, I don't think we're looking at the same slide that you're looking at. We're not seeing any zooming action or um, your, we don't, I don't even see your pointer, so. Oh, really? You can't see my Google, my Google Earth stuff? No, we're not. We see a slide of two um, maps and a fly eating ledge rock. We oh, see no. the, we see well, the PowerPoint. Use, let me, let me, um, whoops, let me see if I can, it says, oh, it says screen sharing pause. Let me try. Why is that? Why am I screen sharing pause? I don't want to pause it. Give me one second. And if this doesn't work, then I'll just skip this part. But I was really looking forward to doing this part. How about this new share? How about this? Can you see a Google Earth map now? Yes, oh. perfect. And and Sorry. go ahead and uh, take all the time you want, Yancy. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, everyone, I'm sure everyone's enjoying this. Well. Believe me, if it's not working, you guys let me know and I'll wrap it up. But uh, sorry about that. That's interesting. I've never done it before where I try to switch between screens and Zoom. And what, what the, I just learned is that you've actually got to reshare to show the other screen. So anyways, just a technical point. Okay, so here's, here's Upper Klamath Lake. Here is uh, Rocky Point Resort. Oh, and just a, a, a side note. I have no idea why this thing is called Upper Klamath Lake. There is no Lower Klamath Lake. <laughs> but there it is. And uh, as you can kind of see, if you can see this at all, um, you know, this entire thing here is kind of like this greenish color because the whole thing is just six feet deep. Right over here, there is a deep channel right here along this thing here. But other than that, it's six feet, four feet deep. Um, Again, here's Rocky Point. This is the place that uh, Denny Rickert owned forever and where he developed all of his flies and, and lines. Uh, there's a restaurant there and a little campground. Uh, and then this up here is, this is uh, Agency Lake. Um, I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit now. So some of the labels will appear. Uh, this is Chiloquin and this is the Williamson River. So, uh, zoom in a little bit more. Oh yeah, you can see now the agency lake popping up there. And um, just real quick too, I'm gonna come back to this in a second. Uh, this place, here's the Wood River up here. Um, I'm gonna mention this in a second, but you know, if you get down here, you might as well go fish the Wood River too, because it's wonderful. Um, the access to the Wood River is a bitch. That's all there is to it. Um, there's a place right here called Petrick Park. 
you can launch a boat into this nasty a channel that's been dug out here. It's just filled with plants. And every time you try to row anything, your oars get stuck in lilies. It's just icky. But once you spend 15 minutes getting through this crap, then you get out here to this nice open channel and then into the Wood River. And the Wood River is uh, a wonderful place to fish as well. So just a little side note. Today, what we're going to talk about is this stretch of river from right here all the way down to water wheel. So um, just so you can see that a little bit better. Um, here's Chiloquin, here's the river going on down. Here's 97 crossing it. And we'll zoom in here in a second, but here's the water wheel. So it's just that about eight miles. Okay, so I'm gonna show you kind of how some of the stuff looks and you know where you can use different kinds of techniques. So we're zooming way in here. Is that all working? Can you, when I zoom in, can you see it well? Yes. Okay. So here's Williamson again. Here's the Sprague River. Right here, there's a, uh, and, and here's the boat ramp. Here's, here's the boat ramp. Uh, this is obviously an older satellite photo because it's still all dirt and it's all nasty. This was really nasty. Now it's nicely paved and uh, there's, you know, some, kind of regular state park kind of pit toilets there, which is really nice because um, there wasn't anything like that before. But uh, what a lot of people do is they will fish from here up to the Sprague River and that's it, a day. And the reason why is that it looks like traditional trout river. It looks, people, you know, if you're new to the area, you're with a guide, if I was a guide, I would take people here and this is what I'd do, basically all day. Because people are gonna feel comfortable with it. It's gonna look like a river I've been in before. There's, there's rocks and there's holding water and there's some riffles and rapids and it just, it, it looks fishy. And there are fish in it, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, you know, if, and when I show up here in the morning and I look up here and, you know, there's maybe one boat or no boat, sure, I'll go up there and fish for a while. Um, but this is the most crowded part of the whole river, this little stretch right here. And uh, it's a good spot. So if you get here and uh, there, there's, you know, no one around and get in your boat, come up here. Um, I do weird things like I beach my boat here and I get out and I wade across this area right here. It's really shallow. It's where the Sprague River comes in. There's a big old hole right here that people call the blue hole. Um, then I come down here and I, and I beach my boat right here and I get out in a whole bunch of ledge rock. You can't tell, but actually the, the, the place where you can float is this little narrow section right here. And the rest of this is all this big nasty ledge rock that if you're not careful, you'll um, you know, lose all your flies on. But if you get out, and you know, walk on it, wait on it, then you can you know fish this whole section of river here, which can often have, hold a lot of fish. And so it's just it, it's a neat spot. Um, it just it's just where there's the most people. So I, I I avoid it. It's you should if if you're going to the Williamson for the first time, you should get up there and, and at least look around. Um, this is where you're going to use an intermediate sink line or more likely, if you you know if you're not comfortable with that style of fishing, this is where you're gonna get your 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 bobber out and throw you know nymphs on there, and and that's why the the guides really spend a lot of time here is because you know they want to first thing they want to do is see if their client can cast. Uh, if they can't cast, or they can't, I shouldn't say that. If they can't cast, you know, proficiently long distances, heavy lines, all that stuff, then you know. You can sit in a boat right here and you can throw a bobber out just a few feet and you can, you know, feed line out and you can catch fish. So that's what this section here is all about. Uh, if you go downstream a little bit more here, um, more of that kind of water, uh, here's a spot where you'll have to drag your boat right away. Then there's a big deep hole here. There's a 30 foot deep hole here. There's a 30 foot deep hole here. I fish these areas here. I get out my type six sink line and I catch fish. The guides go right through this and they won't even touch it because you got to have a type six sink line <laughs> and they don't. Um, 
but if you had a, if you're bobber fishing, then, you know, throw on a really long, uh, you know, leader and, and, you know, 10 foot long and put some flies on there and you could, you know, you can float bobbers through here. Uh, then you'll go through here. This is uh, probably the nastiest rapid on the whole thing. And, and it's really not difficult at all. Uh, there's really nothing to it. Um, and at the bottom of that, you know, there's some, there's some good holes too. This whole area right in here just kind of looks like more traditional trout water and people spend a lot of time here. And I typically just blow right through it. I, I typically, when I get in here, I don't start fishing till right here. So here's, here's that rapid that I said is like the nastiest rapid and there's really nothing to it. And then there's some, there's some decent water in here. And then there's all this ledge rock. And then it's just wonderful water after that. And you can see in the picture here, there's a boat. And if you can see right here, oops, there's a cable car crossing. And this is called the cable car hole. And I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of a cripple fly pattern that was invented by a guy named Bob Quigley. I used to fish with Bob Quigley and this was his favorite spot in the whole river. Um, he, 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 you know, we could spend hours here. Um, so this is a big deep hole. You better have a type three or type six. And then as soon as you get down here, you're back to your intermediate or your type three. And all you're doing is you're going down the middle of the river and you're casting to both sides stripping back, this is what I do at least. You know, you could be at, sitting up here with a, with a bobber rig as well, if that's what you like to do. Um, and then we're going down here, uh, you know, some, some small little riffle kind of stuff, but basically all the way down here, what you're doing is just kind of floating down the middle of the river, casting out your intermediate or um, type three line um, until you get right here, and there's another one of these big, deep channels. It's probably 10, 15 feet deep. Uh, and I'm pulling out my type six and, you know, casting down river and letting it sink and stripping it back. Um, right here at this next riffle, rapid ledge rock thing, beautiful hole. Fish will just be stacked up right at the top of this thing. You know, you, you approach this really slowly, carefully not making too much noise anchor up right about here cast over here let your fly swing on up right up to these rocks and uh, hold on then you uh get to this spot right here you're definitely going to get out and drag your boat through here or even your pontoon boat um, as you're going through here recognize there are a few deep holes um and then uh, you're definitely going to have to drag through here as well, you get to the bottom of this island, you beat your boat, you walk up here and you fish this hole, which is a beautiful hole. You stand in the water, right? Whoops. You stand in the water right here and you cast out into this hole here. And that's it for the rapids, basically. After that, it's all frog water. It's just this slow moving. If you didn't know any better, you'd say there's no trout there. There's no way trout don't like this kind of water. It's just this slow moving. It's like a slow lake. And this is where most of the fish are. Uh, I, I can't tell you how often I talk to people and they say, no, I, you know, I stopped fishing right here and then just rode on down. And, you know, they should have done the exact opposite. Because these fish, they just are hanging out in here. And uh, so lots of, lots of, you know, six foot deep water, lots of 10 foot deep water, some holes that are, you know, 15 foot deep. Just realize, and believe me when I tell you that the fish are in this slow water. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a drift boat like I am, um, often, you know, I'll just, I'll just let the river kind of at that very slow pace, just take me downstream, casting, casting, casting. If I catch something great, I drop my anchor and I, I land the fish. Uh, if, if, if not, you know, I'll row back up, change my fly, try it again. Um, 
but it that's just what it is it's like, it's like that all the way down here there are a few little little riffly things in here and and uh but basically all the way down here it's just the same thing there's it's it's kind of nondescript um and but believe me the fish are there so i'm gonna zoom out a little bit because it's kind of the same i mean you, you know there'll, there'll be like these well, here's a good example it would be like these, just these little small indentations in the, in the bank there. And the fish will just be stacked up in there. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. I, I, you, you know, you tell me. But, the, you know, so I'll slowly come down here. I say, oh, there's a little indentation. And I'll just really carefully cover this water. And if I didn't get a fish there, I'll change my fly and I'll do that next indentation. And I'm out here as far away as I can cast accurately to the spot. Um, a lot of people don't like this style of fishing. You know, it's it's not, it, you know, you're not reading the water the same way you would say, you know, if you're, you're fishing, you know, most of the rivers. Um, but uh, you're going to catch some big fish. So you can see, you know, there, there, there are things going on in, in the shore here next to... Uh, Next to the river, you can't see any of this. You know, there's the, the, the banks are a little bit high. You know, when you're in the water here, it's basically like you're out in the middle of nowhere. A train will be will come by every now and then and they'll honk their horn at you. Um, so there's stuff going on up on the shores, but you can't you, you can't see it. Now we get down here. Here's the lonesome duck. Lonesome duck is uh, a place where you can rent, you know, a kind of a small cabin kind of thing. It's a nice spot, nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, they actually have their own boat ramp right up here. That's their boat ramp. And, and from there, you can actually row up river quite some, some ways. So, you know, it's a perfectly fine idea to go to Lonesome Duck, use their boat ramp, you know, move, go upstream, go downstream. There's actually another boat ramp right here uh, in front of, of, the, of the Lonesome Duck. And to keep going down, and we're basically to the end of it, here's the Clamoya. Uh, casino. Here's the uh, sleep in motel. Here's the truck stop. Can't cannot see this from the river. And then um, right around in here, somewhere. This is this is the uh, right right down here. This is the uh, uh, pumping station where they're taking water all the river into the what's called the Modoc Main Canal. And that's about the end of the fishing. Uh, after that, you're going to. Uh, drag your boat <laughs> through these rapids underneath uh, 97 bridge. And I just wanna warn you, the first time you ever do this, you're gonna want to go right, do not go left. From up here, you can't see this. From up here, it looks like, oh, there's this nice deep channel there. I'm gonna go right. And first time I ever did this, you know, over 10 years ago, I got to right about here and I, oh crap. And I got out and I had a drag. This is the worst drag of the whole trip. Uh, my boat over this. So you're coming down underneath the bridge, stay left, stay left here. Here's the old pump house. Most likely there'll be a bunch of local kids jumping off this into the pool right there. Big deep swimming hole. Stay left, stay left, stay left, stay left until you get down to here. And that's the water wheel boat ramp. Very nice boat ramp. And um, so anyways, I hope that wasn't too much right there, but I just wanted to show you what's going on. Now let's try to go to, okay. Can you see my PowerPoint now? No. Okay, so let me try this again. Whoops, share screen, PowerPoint. Okay, go into um, presentation mode. All right. So oh, we just uh, flew the river using go Google Earth. I hope that was as good for you as it was for me. It makes me want to go fishing. Um, so uh, I mentioned, you know, this fly eating reg uh, ledge rock. Uh, it can be your friend. Um, as you can see here, I do, you know, there's no reason to use waders here. It's, you know, 80 degrees out. And, you're not getting out of the boat very often, uh, or if you are, you know, it's, it's, 
you're not getting in deep water. You know, I, I'm, I'm a real sun avoider. So, you know, long sleeve, white shirts, and long, you know, tropical weight pants and just some water sandals. I, I loved it, you know, as I'm going down the river, beach my boat and get out on the, on the ledge rock and, and, uh, and go fishing. Uh, Wood River, Wood River is nearby. It's a great spot to go fishing. We, I kind of touched on that for a second. There's another place, Agency Lake, uh, early in the season can be a, a great place to fish. Uh, but, you know, sometimes before the fish are, are going up the river, they're just out here in Agency Lake. Uh, there's a thing called the Agency Lake Resort, which is about as fanciful a name as you can ever imagine. This place is, I'm not sure if it's ever saw a good day. I was going to say it's it seen better days, but I'm not sure I ever saw a good days. And they don't really have a ramp, but there's a spot there where you can kind of on the dirt uh, launch your boat, I think for uh, 10 bucks. Uh, here's the Williamson River again. Here's Chiloquin. Um, I really, if you're going to go down there for an extended stay, you know, for three, four days, um, you know, spend a day either on Agency Lake uh, if you if you have a drift boat. You wouldn't want to go out there in a pontoon or you know out here on the wood river or come on over here to uh recreation creek slash rocky point um there's also a place here called harriman springs uh, uh, this is wonderful fishing uh denny ricketts will tell you the biggest fish in klamath basin are here and i think he's right uh, the problem is, is that everyone from Medford, uh, Ashland, and Grads Pass comes here, so it can be crowded. Okay, so uh, lodging and food. Uh, there's my friend Scott again. Uh, this is the week part of the trip. Uh, Collier Memorial State Park uh, campground burned down last year, which took away a lot of the camping. Uh, and as I've mentioned, there's a sleep-in motel next to the Clamoyas Casino. Mentioned the Lonesome Duck. Lots of VRBO options. I personally stay at the Water Wheel RV Park. Um, it's amazing what's happened there in the last few years. Um, you guys are aware, as, as I am, of you know, everyone is living in campers now and driving around. They've got their sprinter vans, what have you. Um, and what used to be a sleepy little park that are, you know, any day of the year I could just kind of pull in and, and get a spot, you know, next to the river now is frequently sold out, uh, you know, weeks in advance. So if you're planning a club outing uh, and you guys are gonna try to camp together, I would get my reservations at the Water Wheel uh, as soon as they open in March. It's, it's shocking how popular that place has become. Uh, and the only food nearby is uh, at the casino and it's not very good. <laughs> or at the truck stop right next to the casino, and it's even worse. So uh, there used to be a, a really good Mexican restaurant nearby, but they had problems with their septic system. So, and uh, there used to be a place called Molita's, which was not a very good restaurant nearby, but it's closed as well. So uh, there is a restaurant here at Rocky Point, which is 45 minutes away. And there is a restaurant here at Harriman Springs, which is 45 minutes away. Sometimes I'll come over here and go fishing at Harriman Springs just so that that night I can have a decent meal. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if I'm down there for a week or something. But typically what I'm doing is I'm staying at the, uh, the water wheel and uh, employing my very limited cooking skills. Uh, Another picture, uh, a little quick story about this. This is a former COF club president. He bought a trip from me at one of our uh, you know, fundraising auctions. Uh, we went down there for a few days. Um, you know, big smile on his face. He, he loved this fish. I will tell you on that day, it took him about two hours to remember how to cast a sinking line you know, more than 40 feet. And then it took him probably three fish before he got this one to actually land it. Um, so... Uh, by the time he actually got this fish in the boat and when he got the, the trophy photo, he was a happy camper because you know, figuring out how to make the cast was frustrating, but then losing two or, th two or three fish, uh, you know, they hooked up because he didn't know how to play it properly. Um, you know, that, that can be frustrating. So my point here is not to mock Alan because his, his experience is exactly the experience I had when I started fishing this river. 
um, and everyone else, it's to say, hey, it's a weird river. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't care how good an angler you are, it's not like any place you've fished anywhere else. So I really recommend using a guide your first time. Um, you know, they're gonna, I, I showed you in that little fly over some of the spots, I'm sure it went right over your head. Uh, but the guides know where where to take you, and uh, they'll quickly put you in the right spot based on your fishing uh, style, uh, abilities, etc. So, uh, two guides I can recommend: a guy named Craig Schumann. Uh, after spending three, four, five days down on the river and just beating my head against the wall. I finally hired Craig and, and uh, that was, you know, I don't know, 12 years ago. And it's been off the races ever since. And then uh, Brent Hubelitz is a great guy as well. So, you know, don't be shy on your first day or second day, get a guide. Um, I think this is, all. Yeah. so, uh, you know, as you know, we're all in a drought. Uh, it's, it was bad here last summer. It's going to be worse next summer. Um, we are in great shape compared to the Klamath Basin. I've been fishing down there for, like I said, over 10 years. Um, and the last two years have been really depressing. Uh, last year, last year in particular was, was just heartbreaking. And I checked the uh, gauges today and the Williamson is at half uh, what it should be right now. And, and you know they have we've got a ton of water compared to what they have so um be careful when you're down there uh please 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 don't use a five weight rod uh you, you're just not going to be able to land these fish expeditiously you're going to put too much stress on them they're already totally stressed out uh play the fish as little as possible make sure you use a, a, a barbless hook you know, take that trophy photo, you know, but quickly don't drop the fish in the boat, wear a glove. I mean, these are all things that we all know we should do, but it's just critical down there. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's so bad. There are places that I've been fishing for a long, long, long time where I couldn't even drift, uh, launch my boat last year. So um, anyways, that's my little public service announcement. Um, you know, go have a good time, get down there earlier in the season that you might, then you might read about in, you know, magazines and stuff and just be careful. And that's it. And I'm 10 minutes over what I had planned. So sorry about that. <clears throat> that's okay. That was wonderful. So um, let's have some questions. Let me unmute everybody. See. Or everybody just um, at the left bottom part of your screen, you can unmute yourselves. Maybe that would be easier. Yep. Yep. Nice presentation, Yancy. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. And, and honestly, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Happy to chat about that whole area down there. Um, you know, I only scratched the surface of, of all the wonderful fishing in that area. Okay, so Yancy, if you can stop screen sharing, then we can see all of the other. Uh, yep. Sorry. Bullet. There you go. There we go. And then if anybody wants to hit their gallery view, you can see who else is here. Questions? <laughs> More questions? What a great presentation. No questions. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you covered everything. No, actually. Somebody asking a question? Let's see. So, Yancy, it's Bob Shimani. What strippers do you use beside Denny's? Do you use anything else beside Denny's? Uh, streamers i know he has a number of them you know i i, I just you know I, I just use his flies uh I, I fish with a lot of people who don't you know who tie their own they've got their own woolly buggers you know guys who are tires i i don't think they're that selective i really don't um 
I will say, I think I catch more fish than most people, but uh, <laughs> that's just because I probably spend more time down there and, you know, and I can cast pretty well and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think the, the fly is the, it's probably the least important thing. On the other hand, I will tell you, I've been in spots where I knew there were fish and I went through three or four flies until I finally found the right fly. And boom, you know, it just, it just happens. So I think the right thing to do is just don't get hooked on any one fly. Um, different colors, different sizes, but uh, maybe I'm just lazy, but I, I just use Denny's flies. You know, I, fish, I fish agency quite a bit with a guide over the years, and uh, he often puts a dro uh, dropper on. On He'll use like a leech or a seal bugger and then put yep. a dropper on like a, yep. one year it was like a size 10 prints, and they would always hit that prints. This is in the lake though. Yep. And you can do the same thing in the river. I will tell you, a lot of people do that. I don't because it just, I, I get follow things up. You know, it just, I, I'm not sure it, it improves anything for me. Um, I, I'm not sure my catch rate is any higher. And I just have a, I have a, not more of an opportunity to screw up my cast with that. But yeah, I see a lot of people do that. And, I, and it's obviously a great way to go. So I notice all your flies, uh, none of them are beadhead. That's because Again, you're using the sinking line, and 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 the shank is wrapped, is lead wrapped, so there's weight to it. Now the, the the thing is, and 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 so if you if you call up Denny and you talk to him, he'll tell you beat heads are terrible, and the reason why is because what he wants, and the reason I like this this uh, line, the, the 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 fly line, which is you know the level, uniform sink line, is that he wants a uniform, flat retrieve back, right? So you cast out count one two three four five strip back cast out again count one two three four five six strip back right level retrieve with a with a bead head if it's a way to be head then what you have is you have this going on yep and he doesn't want that i don't know i'm not an entomologist i know i catch a lot of fish it works so that's all i can say Nancy, with the uh, river being so low, do you think you're going to be able to get a boat through that bottom section? Hey, Leanne, I think, uh, you know, all the years I've been dragging boats, I'm going to drag a lot more boats this year. <laughs> it's going to be nasty. And yeah. I think I think that the uh, the bigger issue is, I, I'm not sure if you are here uh, earlier when I was talking about this, but I would not be surprised if the river is uh closed uh you know what, what, what's the term that odfw uses um you know they at two o'clock in the afternoon you have to stop fishing who down I mean, the river, what, what was that term they use Hoot owl. yeah exactly thank you so i mean it's just so low yeah so. okay I think I saw on the regulations that you could only use a single fly in the river, but I'm not sure. I'm not positive on that. And I went with a guide that we used two flies. Well, uh, the regulations until recently, uh, and this was something that I was a little involved with, uh, with my role in ODFW, but um, the regulations used to be that you could uh, use multiple barbs on your hooks and you could, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, multiple hooks. Like it's like you can have like a a spinner, you know, with a treble hook. That's the word I'm looking for. You can use treble hooks and things like that. So what recently changed was single barbless hook. But I don't think it says only that there's no dropper fly. I could be wrong on that, but I don't recall that as part of the new regulations. But I do know it's single barbless hook. We could look it up quick, pretty quick. I bet that made you popular with the locals. Uh, surprisingly, there was support for that. Uh, you know, three years before that, there was no support for it. But uh, um, folks down there, you know, understand what's going on. And there was actually support for it. Um, the thing that disappointed me was it wasn't that regulation wasn't made basin wide. So. Uh, there are other places where you can go, you know, other tributaries where the same fish are migrating up there and you can still use, you know, treble hooks and, and barbs and things like that. So, yeah, small steps.
Yeah, right. Single purpose hooks. And any other questions? I think this was an amazing presentation, Nancy. Yeah. You know, oh, uh, Le Leanne told me to ask you, and we were crossing our fingers. Um, I, I read some of the documents that you sent to the COF when you guys were leading the um, campouts down there. So it was great. Well, good. I'm glad you got something out of it. I have a presentation on bull trout fishing on the Lake Village Chinook too. If you ever want to, you know, if you're running desperate no, sometime I, later this year. I, I was just thinking about that. What are you doing in the next month or two? Because we're <laughs> going to start, start thinking about going to Lake Billy pretty soon, right? Next week is the first release of Smoltz. So, I mean, you guys understand how this whole thing works, right? So you, gotta, you have these, uh, these bull trout in there and, and typically they're you know, on the Metolius arm or they used to be typically on the Metolius arm waiting for the, uh, the kokanee smolts to come down the river. Well, now that ODFW is releasing smolts into uh, the Cricket River and um, uh, uh, the Mill to Chutes as part of the you know, reintroduction pro, uh, process for both Steelhead and uh, Chinook, uh, so now there's all these smolts coming down those tributaries as well. And the first Chinook smolt release is in the Crooked River Arm next week. I start fishing for bull trout usually right about now. <laughs> Just a tip. Is that true with on the shoots too? They're going to do this. The shoots next week? No, they're staggered. Oh. Uh, over. So there'll be small releases uh, in the Metolius, not for Steelhead, but for uh, Chinook. There are both Chinook and Steelhead releases in the middle of the shoots, and there's uh, Chinook and Steelhead releases in the uh, Crooked. Um, the first batch are Chinook, and they alternate between the tributaries. And then uh, April, it shifts over to uh, steelhead. So basically, from now until early May, uh, there will be these re releases. The issue for bull trout, I don't want to give a whole presentation here right now, guys. It's getting late. But the issue for bull trout is that they're very temperature uh, sensitive. So you've got to be there when there's food in the water and the lake's not too hot. So usually right around, you know, late April or mid-May, depending on the conditions, even though there, there are smolts in the river, the bull trout get too low for fly fishermen, right? So the gear guys keep having a great time, but, you know, I'm out there, you know, with my eight weight rod casting a type eight sink, full sink line and even if I count to 30, you know, it's just not getting down very deep, right? And, and you know, when the bull trout are 80 feet, they're untouchable. But there is this wonderful window, uh, you know, from right about now, we're a little early, maybe two weeks from now until, depending on the conditions, maybe, uh, you know, April-ish, late April, where they're up at the surface, and uh, it's almost sight fishing because what will happen is that, you know, the smolts, <laughs> okay, I'm giving the presentation, but <laughs> the smolts will uh, get released and they are, uh, you know, hugging the bank, the shoreline, and they're up pretty high and you'll see them jumping. Well, why are they jumping? They're jumping because a bull trout is chasing them. And so you zip over to where that is and you can cast over to those guys. And, you know, it's, it's tough. This is tough fishing. It's just, it's tough fishing, just like the links. Um, but man, is it fun? It is so fun. So anyways. What, what size rod and line did you say? Did you say you're using an eight weight and a, and a. <laughs> well, uh, so I, I'll use this, I'll take a six weight. I take three rods, <laughs> I take three rods, two six weights and an eight weight. And the, the reason I have the eight weight is not because you need it for the fish. The six weight will handle the fish um, nine times out of 10. I mean, I've had, I have had a bull trout on my six weight where I couldn't end it. But 
that's extremely rare. Um, the reason I have the eight ways because I'm throwing a really big fly. You know, it's, it's it's this is a 12 inch long fly with a big hook in it, and you need to have enough backbone to get that thing out there. Now, I don't really like fishing that that much, especially if there's any wind, because I kind of value my ears and things like that. Uh, so typically, I have a six weight rod with a with my type six full sink line, and then you know like a Klaus or minnow. Um, but anyways, there's a whole presentation there that uh, you know all you know tactics. I will be in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> please, please do. I was just thinking. I wonder who I know that knows Lake Billy because I know that uh, I love going out there, but you know. It's kind of hit and miss, but I'm, I'm sure I know a couple of other people who would love to go out there too that have, have boats and are willing. So yeah, I'll be in touch with you, Yancey, but I won't <laughs> keep you any longer. I, I know you have a real job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. You. It was great. Thanks, yeah. Yancey. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yancey. Okay, and everybody else, thanks for coming. Um, next month, I'll, I'm gonna try to send the link out with the presentation notice um, that got, uh, we're trying to, we're, the people on the website, me included, are just trying to figure this stuff out right now. So hopefully it'll get out um, the week before and maybe the day before with the link so that everybody doesn't have to email me and wait for their emails for that. So, and then this record, this will be, this has been recorded and should be up on the YouTube site in a week or two when um, Phil gets back. So thank you, everybody. We're good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Hi, Mike. <laughs>